give a word of appreciation and thanks to James. Uh, James ably assists the Education Committee with uh, research papers and they are of immense value to trying to aid and assist politicians who like to give the impression that they know what they're talking about, but in reality, they only use other people's information and they use it very badly. So with that uh, opening uh, comment, can I say that I'm delighted that you are here this afternoon and can I welcome you to this seminar, the theme uh, being education, innovation and entrepreneurship. In this fast changing world, innovation is no longer just an option uh, for the adventurous from the fledging businesses to the world's largest corporations those that want to thrive must adapt and keep evolving. Indeed, innovation and entrepreneurship are recognised as the keys to global economic recovery. And so there are a number of things that I think are necessary for us to consider. How can we inspire and equip our young people with the skills which will enable them to become the innovators and the scientists of the future? How do we educate young people to not only embrace change, but to imitate that change? How do we instill the necessary confidence in our young people to start their own businesses? We in the Education Committee uh, have been calling for uh, more of our pupils to get involved in the STEM subjects in our schools. The STEM skills are essential for a successful economy and are naturally associated with research and development. It is therefore vital that we do all that we can to encourage our young people to take an interest in these subjects. The performance by Northern Ireland schools in the recent BT Young Scientists and Technology exhibition this year was an outstanding uh, <coughs> achievement and demonstrates the talent that exists in our schools. Indeed, I have the personal uh, privilege of uh, going to that event in Dublin and to seeing firsthand uh, from uh, our pupils and our schools, uh, the enthusiasm with which they took part and the mind-boggling and mind-blowing uh, innovative approach that they had. But I was just saying to someone before the event started, the one issue that did really uh, come home to me very, very forcefully when I was there, uh, the BT Young Scientist has two categories, uh, primary and post-primary. The most telling element of the visit was Northern Ireland was reasonably well represented in the post-primary in the number of schools that took part, but no schools from the primary. And I think that that is something that we in the Education Committee are, have become very concerned about uh, and something that we have been doing some work on recently. And we will endeavour over the next number of weeks and months to ensure that there is progress made that next year schools from the, the uh, primary sector are, are, do take part. The science projects varied, of course, from the very practical uh, at the event in Dublin uh, with such improvements to medical safety and the help for farmers in developing countries to harvest seeds to the more uh, challenging uh, and more uh, uh, demanding uh, elements of the technology that is around us. And all the young people involved were enthusiastic and knowledgeable and should be very proud of their achievements. And I was proud and pleased to be there, as did the Education Minister uh, and did some of my colleagues uh, go down to say, well done. Northern Ireland has a rich history of scientific and engineering endeavours, and it is crucial that we embrace this innovative heritage if we are to succeed on the world stage. Our speakers today are going to share their thoughts on the challenges and opportunities facing our education system with respect to promoting innovation and entrepreneurship. Professor Nigel Mason of the Open University will address the issues involved in widening participation in science and technology. The United Kingdom, like most of Europe, is struggling to attract the younger generation into STEM subjects. And Professor Mason will examine the challenges and discuss the importance of ensuring that careers in STEM are attractive to the next generation. Uh, Professor Theresa Gremon of the University of Ulster will introduce a recent European comparative study which focuses on the relationship between science, education and creativity in the early years. These presentations will discuss the differences between the 
preschool and primary settings and outline implications for policy development. They will also outline the challenges faced and the opportunities seized by practitioners. So the final presentation will be delivered in partnership with uh, Professor Podrick McGowan of the University of Ulster and Dr Richard Blundell of the University of Ulster, the Open University, and also Dr Kirsten Reid, also from the Open University. Their presentation is entitled Delivering Effective Enterprise Education will uh, review developments in this field with particular focus on the potential contribution of new technologies. They will consider how to equip the entrepreneurs of the future with the key skills required to succeed. I trust that this afternoon will, as I have no doubt, be beneficial and helpful. And in the Education Committee, we look forward to using much of what will be said in the presentations today to inform us in our deliberations. Our job is uh, under the legislation to hold the department and the minister to account, and we endeavour to do that to the best of our ability. And I trust that what is said here today will be uh, advantageous to us for ultimately to ensure that our young people in Northern Ireland are well equipped and well placed to take their rightful place in the world for uh, years and generations to come. You're welcome and I trust that this event today is very successful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I have actually been collaborating uh, with Northern Ireland universities since I was a PhD student in the 1980s and it's always been very much part of my academic career and many of the young people who have now gone on to jobs um, working with me and abroad have come through uh, Belfast and Ulster <coughs> universities. What I want to talk about in this presentation, uh, realising potential and widening participation in science and technology, is I'd like to take away two or three for key facts. The first is that this is not a problem which is local to Northern Ireland. It's not a problem that is local to the UK. It is not even a problem that is local just to, to Europe. It is a problem that is widespread. And in looking at reviewing the situations, we have to learn from those areas, wherever they may be, that have tried to solve what is a key problem. But if we take the United Kingdom and then gradually go down, the science and technology sector is a key sector in merging the problems with the recent economic issues. Science and technology has a higher than average productivity. 65% of our export market comes from basically high-tech firms. It contributes disproportionately to the GBA, and it's absolutely key to seeing the UK as an internationally competitive, productive country, uh, both in people and in products. Now, in Northern Ireland, there's a lot of of science and technology companies based in here, they form a large amount of the exports from Northern Ireland. I've told the last figures which I could find um, from my office here was about 4.5 billion uh, from Invest in Northern Ireland. But overall, the GVA per employee is actually less than the UK average. So if Northern Ireland was to increase its science, technology, and engineering based productivity, actually the mean income, etc., would actually go up. Now, you're all aware that. The government have been reviewing how we were going to come out of the recession in every area, and the biz have particularly been looking at the areas of STEM. And in the 2010, they, they highlighted areas that they thought in technology that the UK should have a unique world role in, should push. And these were advanced manufacturing, <coughs> low carbon industries, space, particularly um, prone to the Open University. I don't know if many of you have been watching the Rosetta Wake Up this week. The Open University is a key player in that. There was a very big party at about 5 o'clock in Milton Keynes when it talked to us <coughs> and in the life sciences. And if you look at Matrix Northern Ireland, you will see some of those same topics. So, that, so Northern Ireland is very much lined up. But I will highlight that in Northern Ireland ICT, information uh, computing and technology, is a very key market. And I might come back to that um, in that. But you will see advanced materials there. You will see life and health. Of course, there's also agri-food, which is special for Northern Ireland, perhaps, compared to other parts of the UK, very strong in that area and the science behind it. Whether you're in the UK, whether you're in Northern Ireland, whether you're in the Republic, whether you're in France, the same problem 
is that there is a shortage of people to work in the STEM area. So at the moment we have about a 4 million, sort of 4 million workforce of what we call UK STEM professionals. They are people who, if you ask them what they do as their job, will mention in some way science, technology, and engineering, and medicine. But I want to highlight that about 1.9 million of those are what we might call technicians in the old-fashioned terminology. That's a very high proportion, and they're the proportion which often are forgotten about. We often tend to concentrate about those people who will go through an academic career, who will go to very high-quality uh, PhD public work, but actually much what companies need are what you might call the technical staff, scientifically literate people, people who understand the changing world of science and technology and work in it, but may not come through the traditional academic background. Also, if you are a scientist in this area, if you are this area, your unemployment rate is relatively low. And that's another key part, particularly to get over to students when they're trying to think about subjects. Now, it's estimated that we need, as a country, about 830,000 graduates uh, level and 450,000 technicians by 2020. But at best, we're producing 100,000 graduates a year, a year to maintain that status. That's the number we need. We need 100,000 graduates per year. We are, if we're lucky, producing 90,000. But a large proportion of those graduates do not stay in science. Indeed, many scientists do go into administration, into management, etc. Compare that with India. India this year is producing 700,000 graduates in this. In engineering, we're producing 23,000 graduates. In India, they're producing eight times as many per year, and in China, 20 times as many per year. So if a company wishes to invest and looks for a workforce, India and China are very, very um, attractive for that reason. Just for Northern Ireland, the figures are here. In, actually, in Northern Ireland, the highest, slightly higher proportion than in England and, and, and particularly in Scotland and Wales actually do study STEM subjects. And and, uh, but many of those students don't stay in Northern Ireland. Many students do come over to uh, England, Wales, Scotland. I should say that seven, th seven, th about seven percent study through the Open University. So the plug for the Open University, we are a very important part of the, of the sector in here. And, over the last few years, quite a lot of students have trained in Northern Ireland, but they've left Northern Ireland. Very good for other people, but not for that. So many of the documents, as you are aware, Northern Ireland business have identified this skill shortage in the STEM subjects. So what I want to talk about is how are we going to fill the gap? How are we going to fill the gap? It isn't going to be able to fill the gap by just looking at the traditional people who, since the 1960s and 1970s, have gone through traditional degrees in Russell Group type universities. That's not going to be able to expand to fill the numbers, but more importantly, it probably isn't producing the graduates that much of the industry and business needs. So where are the under, which are the areas which are underrepresented? Well, a key area that's underrepresented is gender. We still face the fact that outside medicine and the life sciences, in the physical sciences and some of the engineering, only 13% of that workforce are women. And in fact, in engineering, only 6% of the UK workforce in engineers are female. And that gender imbalance starts at school. It starts at A-level. Uh, though more women do do STEM at a percentage in Northern Ireland than others, but across the country, it's still a big issue. The other area are underrepresented, which are very strongly underrepresented in STEM are ethnic groups. There is a very low uptake in the Asian and the black community, that black community being both African and the Caribbeans which is surprising in many respects because the Asian community has a much higher representation often in, in higher education. They tend to go into other areas of higher education. They don't tend to go into STEM. And disability. We, we are aiming much more to get more disabled students to come into the workforce. Again, they don't tend to come into the STEM subjects. About 12%, for example, would come under the STEM particularly, compared to 20% in engineering. And STEM is very underrepresented in, in the lower socioeconomic groups. And yet they're exactly the sort of people we might want to bring through into the workforce in the technical area, and they're not being attractive. So a STEM action agenda has to be to mobilise a wider part of the workforce who see STEM as an advantage and to want to do it. And there are many bodies that are trying to do this. Wise Women in Science and Engineering is a well-established body. IOP, Institute of Physics, has produced many documents reviewing these figures and is very active in Ireland, both north and south. 
uh, extremely active in reviewing all these aspects. And indeed, there are things like matrix that are actually appointing STEM ambassadors. The other issue is it's no good producing a lot of, for example, female scientists and then not retaining them. And the retention rates of women scientists who graduate and get PhDs who stay in science after taking a career break is very low. And we have to address the opportunity, the career opportunity. The return after the career break is perhaps one of the real things that we could really tackle because there's a huge pool of trained people who have gone through that. They then have the family break and they don't come back into science in that kind. They tend to go more back into administration or other things. They do not go back into the practicing of science. And that might be an issue we want to talk about. Um, we also have to uh, think about where women go. Uh, industry opportunities. We know that fewer women, for example, lead STEM businesses on boards. Those figures are quite low. And probably one of the real problems is the role model issue. It is still a problem for, for, for many women about seeing that they can have a career in science and the role model through. And that, that, that is a real issue. If we want to talk about the ethnic diversity, it's much the same. We have to get into those, those areas and get more of those to think about following STEM careers. And the disabled students, exactly the same. Now, of course, that's why the Open University, we work with these people. We particularly work with most disabled students, etc. And it means that the way of getting them into STEM is perhaps less traditional ways of teaching STEM at higher education. The Open University for Science doesn't always talk about training geologists or physicists or chemists. It talks about training the rounded scientists, the scientifically literate person who understands the methodology and, method and ways of doing science. That's what we try to train in our, our degrees. And those are the sort of people who also might take up apprenticeships. And they want to learn throughout their career. So they reinvent themselves several times in their career. And that's really what I want to leave you with, this idea that if we're going to crack the problem of really having a strong workforce in the UK and in Northern Ireland, or generally in Europe, we can't retain just thinking about those traditionally that have gone through for doing science. That rather small minority that follow their way through the Russell Group approach. We've got to think about widening it out to people who haven't thought about doing science and technology as a career. And we have to think about mobilising areas like uh, female women, uh, workforce, where we also have to address the issue about them coming back into the workforce and retaining them. And so if we're going to solve the problem, I want to leave you with widening participation really means targeting those areas where STEM has not yet been seen as an attractive career. Thank you very much.